And uh, this is a report by uh, Dr. Scott Inch and his postdoc at the time, Eduardo Martins, on uh, climate change impacts, on stock differential climate change impacts on Fraser sockeye. It's a marvelous report. And again, not all sockeye are created equally. Some are very susceptible to uh, slight changes in temperature, and others are far more tolerant. And uh, he, uh, he actually can predict some mortality rates uh, based on, on these susceptibilities. So these kind of reports came out uh, amongst some other ones I'll talk about that really shed a lot of light on various impacts on, on Fraser sockeye. Uh, this is what happens when you get staff to do slides for you, they, you know, they cartoon the executive director and everything like that. Uh, I, was, I was actually uh, called to, to testify on, on aquaculture, uh, but I guess the thing is I can't blame uh, Stan because he had the task of going through this ringtail database where they had over 500,000 documents uploaded. Uh, from the federal government, things that we've never seen before, and we'll never see again. You know, memos on, and, you know, from Treasury, but memos from on, you know, planning uh, uh, sessions from, uh, you know, the, uh, the regional staff and, and the back and forth to Ottawa, and so we had to go through all of those budgets and, and try and select the ones that would actually be brought forward. It was really hard. Sometimes the lawyers were just putting evidence in. You know, just one after another, after another, so they would get them in, and not even any time to cross exam. There was trading going on between the lawyers and among the lawyers. You know, give me ten to your minutes because I really got to get this evidence in here. So it was a real struggle. Uh, you know, as I said, there were fewer than uh, you know three thousand official pieces of evidence out of five hundred thousand that were uploaded, and those are all gone now. So you're not allowed. We had to sign confidentiality agreements on these. We couldn't discuss them with, any, with anyone. Uh, you know, in order to review these documents. So just a little bit on the water crisis, one of the things that I testified about, uh, we have a great interest in groundwater and tried to get across that it's very valuable to wild salmon uh, in terms of thermal regulation and flow regulation. Uh, and it's not protected at all under the current water act. Um, and, you know, you can you drill next to the Nicola River, suck out all the groundwater you want. Nobody's going to stop you. Uh, we talked a lot about hydro impacts. There are hydro impacts on Sockeye, Seton area, uh, other places, but generally, Fraser is free of most hydro impacts. This is a big one. We're doing a, a, another a report coming out soon, an expert report on Runner River impacts. So we talked a lot about the fact that there's no planning or assessment, proper assessment of Runner River impacts on hydro issues. The Water Act modernization process has been very long in, in, the, in the process. There's lots of promise, uh, but there are lots of practical constraints in terms of how much water you can take away from humans to get the fish. So we're still waiting for that. And uh, we also had some statements of expectation on uh, water planning that we, uh, we advanced as well in the inquiry. Uh, we had the comptroller of water rights, uh, Glenn Davidson up there, and uh, our lawyers were asking him, uh, you know, do you have to consider in-stream flows or impacts on fish, fish habitat when you decide to issue a water license? And he says, well, I can if I want, but I don't have to. So, you know, if you think that fish are really getting scrutiny in, in terms of water licenses, you, you know, you heard it right from the horse's mouth, he doesn't really have to. Doesn't really care. Well, he's not a bad guy, you know, he's not a bad guy, but he's really, you know, he operates under the constraints of the legislation, and uh, it's not, it doesn't give him a lot of latitude. Uh, the head of the uh, water sustainability branch, Lynn Prylokin, asked her about, okay, what is, you know, what's going to happen uh, with, you know, the Water Act modernization? Are you going to cover all groundwater in British Columbia? She said, no, not really. We'd like to, but we're going to consider critical areas only. We can't really tell you what those critical areas are right now. So uh, that's a bit of concern as well. Um, our lawyer, Karen Campbell, again asking, uh, we looked at one area in the Stewart River where some DFO people testified that it seemed to be a problem area in terms of water shortages for Stewart Sockeye. And so she asked for open, based on you know, what you heard, would this be considered one of those critical areas? And she said, probably so. Jason Wong was so brave, you know, he's probably paying the penance right now. Uh, Christy Miller did from DFO. <clears throat> she hasn't anybody talked to her from DFO about her testimony yet, from what she said. But uh, Jason Wong was very open, and uh, he again said, look, water act modernization, great concept. The province is not able to deliver it the way that they currently are. I mean, everybody knows how many <clears throat> biological staff they've been cutting in the province. <clears throat> and it's not a good situation. So Cohen's listening to all this. He's writing about what's going on, uh, you know, on all these various issues that impact soccer. So we're really quite interested to 
see how he treats this kind of testimony. <clears throat> the elephant in the room uh, all the time was aquaculture. Um, I was actually out fishing steelhead, and I had to cut my trip short to come back and testify. So you know, I'm still crying about that a little bit. Uh, but it was worth it because we had three weeks of testimony on aquaculture impacts, and uh, the courtroom was pretty full at, at that time. People were really interested in that. Well, yeah, forestry got one day. Uh, pollution, Fraser, yeah, I got a couple of days. Yeah, you know, stuff, stuff there. Aquaculture, it really dragged people out to the, to the courtroom. This is an Atlantic salmon. These are sea lice. You can see them here. It's a little bit hard to see with this light. These are Lepidopteris salmonis, or common salmon louse. Common on the adult salmon in the Pacific. What's uncommon, and what we've done in the last 20 years, is we've concentrated all these adult salmon with lice on them in near shore marine waters. Uh, so in the past, juveniles didn't have to go buy adults that had lice on them, but the lice get on the juveniles, and that's the problem that we see with salmon farming. That's a marine harvest farm that we monitored for a couple of years. 750,000 Atlantic salmon in that farm. And if each of them only has two or three lice, there's millions and millions of lice in those farms. And they're all shedding eggs at exactly the same time that juvenile salmon are migrated by these farms. So this is a situation I've been studying for years, and one of the things I testified about. But one of the interesting things was we pushed really hard to get the salmon farming data. Declined since 1992, 93 which was concurrent with the rise of salmon farming in a big way in British Columbia. We never saw lice and juvenile salmon in BC until 2001. That was the first time. There's threshold effects in ecology. So these farms got bigger and bigger and bigger. We used to have native Chinook and coho in these farms. Not that susceptible to lice. Atlantics are really susceptible to lice. And they make great vectors for transmitting lice to juvenile fish. But we haven't been able to get the farm source data on how many lice are on those farms. It's all proprietary. Well, we said, look, we want data all the way back from every farm, all the way back to the early 90s. And we had a huge fight on our hands with the salmon farmers and the Crown. And it was back and forth and back and forth. They came back and offered five years of data from 20 farms. We said, no, no, that's not good. So we actually uh, put in an affidavit, our files put in an affidavit, and uh, for the Conservation Coalition. And, and Cohen gave us basically everything that we wanted. Not everything, but basically everything we wanted. For the, the sea lice records, and we've never had this before. So, this is our lawyer, Tim Vita, saying we've been trying to gain access to the, the, these data for about 10 years, and we got them in the, in the salmon environment finally. And that becomes important in terms of how the analysis comes out. FOI was free to information. information. Yeah. Sorry about that. Guys. <clears throat> so, what is a mandated DFO? Wildlife farm salmon. Well, here's exhibit 661, a briefing note to the Director General Habitat. As a lead federal department of aquaculture, the FO is explicitly committed to improving public confidence in aquaculture. Wait a minute, I thought they were protecting wild mm -hmm. fish. Well, this is in their memos. It's to improve public confidence because it's taken a beating with all the news about salmon product impacts. All the news. Absolutely. And I like this one here. Uh, Internal DFO communications report. All on the bad publicity they're getting on salmon product. Uh, and they said, if we could get First Nations to support aquaculture, it would take the wind out of the NGO or the non-government organization sales who are, who are criticizing aquaculture. And I thought, yes, well, we've, got some, we've had some effect, some impact on them. Anyways, but this started building the picture. Uh, Greg McDade, uh, you know, courts are funny places. Greg McDade did a masterful job with the Director General of Aquaculture. He put him on the stand. He put his job description on the, on the screen. It's all big right there. And he went through his job description for an hour, an hour, line by line by line. And he got to the end and he says, no. I said, sir, where does it say anything about wild salmon, protecting wild salmon in your job description? <laughs> <laughs> there was absolutely nothing in, in his job description on that. So that's the kind of stuff that he has sat through. And it sort of painted the flavor of where DFO was really coming from. Um, this was kind of interesting, too. This is a budget uh, travel for the regional or the Director General of Aquaculture in Ottawa. Now, what's he doing going to all these cities and states, uh, you know, looking here? This one from Los Angeles is very interesting because I went down with Catherine Stewart and we met with the heads of seafood buyer for Safeway and we explained the impacts on, on aquaculture and on, on, uh, wild fish. And they, they understood the science. They accepted it. They said they would source close containment salmon if they could find them. They just weren't enough around. They accepted all this, but three days later, they're, Director General Aquaculture came down after us and said we were just telling fibs. Uh, so 
we were able to find out that they spent all this money traveling all around promoting aquaculture uh, all around North America, which is kind of interesting. So Did you I stay at a four hundred dollar night hotel. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, these guys are big shots. Come on, right? <laughs> So I just want to I just want to back up just a little bit and tell you how a lot of these test this testimony went. Uh, you know, this is Buzz Allen. He's he's my favorite scientist of all time. He he uh, uh, is he, the guru of adaptive uh, management, and he came up with this really interesting dichotomy. He said science is uncertain to drive the engine inquiry. Where vested interests, and I put it in the crown of the province and farmers, use uncertainty to maintain the status quo. You can't prove impact, right? You guys can't prove these impacts, so we're not going to change. This is what happened all the way through the inquiry. Um, the burden of proof. The government hides behind ecological complexity. Claim. Insufficient evidence for urgent need of action was there all the time. They were asking us to prove that these things were impacting the soccer. And I like this. This is called SCAN. This is a paper, Scientific Certainty Argumentation Method. And it was written by a social sociologist, but it applies to tobacco science, it applies to the impacts of lead, and gasoline, and, and all those kind of things. Science falsifies things. It doesn't prove things. They go out and test things. That this isn't really what's happening. This isn't, you know, it's not about proving. It's really hard to prove anything in science, right? Unless it's more like nuclear physics or something like that. And observers are always calling for proof, often in the guise of scientific certainty. And such calls reflect a lack of understanding of nature science, but a clever and effective political, economic, tactic, scientific certainty, argumentation methods or scams. So just keep that word scams in mind because it comes up all the time. Here's a press release from the DFO from 2005. The source of food, sea lice, and the wild juvenile salmon is a complicated question. Uh, hey, it's complicated. Sea lice are naturally occurring parasites on the wild salmon, but they're not huh? on juvenile salmon, okay? You find them in sticklebacks. Well, you do, but they, they've never found one that can lay an egg on a stickleback because they can't feed on sticklebacks. And herring and many other species of marine fish. This is a scam. This is a scientific certainty argumentation method in order to throw everybody off track. And this is how they, they, the farmers and the crown presented the salmon farm feed all the way through. Um, this is a Mark Costello showing that the evidence of salmon farms are the most significant source of the episode sea lice on juvenile wild salmon. It's totally convincing, but DFO still does not admit that salmon farms are causing episodes in the wild fish. And the crown and the salmon farms would not admit that fact. They tried to disprove it. Uh, leading scientists like uh, Dr. Dick Beamish, you don't see his name here, but he published a paper on a proposed life history strategy for the salmon house. And uh, these academics that looked at his paper, and he, he, he went through this whole paper, and he didn't even mention salmon farms in his paper. You know, this is the lead of the Pacific Biological Station, the DFO. And his, he had a lot of evidence in this inquiry. So he conveniently admitted data when putting these papers forward. He didn't mention salmon farms. And these scientists said his errors of omission and selective use of their own and others' data lead a naive reader to a conclusion that cannot be substantiated. So we made sure we got all these rebuttals of the of science on the table as we went through it as well. It's again a scam because uh, you know, they're trying to promote aquaculture. There's also another one that, out there that was really good. Simon Jones is a scientist. Uh, you may have heard about this. He said, once fish are, are greater than three-tenths of a gram, you know, pink salmon come out of the gravel and go right to the ocean. So do chum salmon, right? Very tiny, very hard to get in the Broughton Archipelago and other areas where salmon lice. But DFO scientists took some into a lab, put a, a, a louse on them, judged their swimming ability, put them in there for about 12 hours, and they declared once they get there, bigger than seven tenths of a, of a gram, they're immune to sea lice. And uh, we've, I've helped Simon Fraser put on seven aquaculture uh, um, uh, workshops so far. We've had all these European scientists over there, and they're saying, what the heck are you guys talking about? We got huge smolts over in Europe, and they're being impacted. By lice, but this is DFO's official line that once these fish get bigger than seven tenths of a gram, and of course the juvenile sockeye that go by the farms are much larger than that. So they're saying, testimony that we don't think the sockeye are impacted at all by sea lice because they're too big by the time they go by the farms. 